Good evening, it's Thursday, May 6th, with a badly aging bridge as his backdrop. President Joe Biden stands in staunchly Republican Louisiana today to pressure Republican lawmakers to support his $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. American Jobs Plan is a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America. A blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America, to supercharge our economy so we can move goods, get to work, become more competitive around the world. And the president, who wants to raise corporate taxes, challenges Republican dogma that low taxes for corporation and the wealthy fuel economic growth while declaring he's willing to make a deal and he dares them, the Republicans, to do the same. A new estimate on the worldwide impact of the coronavirus pandemic. The death toll nearly doubled to almost 7 million deaths. In the United States, deaths nearly a third higher than the official figure at over 900,000. Key opposition to lifting the patent protections for COVID-19 vaccines coming from Germany, which has a robust pharmaceutical industry. The French government, as well as Australia yeah, and Russia, joined the Biden administration in supporting the move. Florida joins the rush to suppress the vote. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signs the bill into law today in a private signing broadcast exclusively on Fox News. The FBI San Francisco office launches a publicity campaign to encourage the victims of hate crimes to come forward and the Biden administration to revoke a rollback on bird protections of the Trump administration. The rollback weakened the government's power to enforce a century-old law protecting most U.S. bird species. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. President Biden today continued his tour to build support for his $2 trillion infrastructure plan. The plan is popular among voters, but is opposed by Republican lawmakers. Biden says he wants to put people to work rebuilding crumbling infrastructure by increasing taxes on the rich and the corporations, partially rolling back former President Donald Trump's 2000 tax cuts that predominantly benefited corporations and the rich. Christopher Martinez reports. President Joe Biden went to the deep south state of Louisiana to tout his $2.2 trillion infrastructure plan, the American Jobs Plan. He spoke at the southwest Louisiana city of Lake Charles with a troubled bridge in the background. A once in a generation investment in American, America itself. To create jobs and modernize our, our bridges, our roads, our highways, our ports, our airports, our water pipes, our water projects, high speed internet transmission lines and sustainable housing sustainable housing jobs rebuilding the foundations of a strong fair and resilient resilient competitive economy the stop was part of biden's getting america back on track tour aimed at building public support for his plan the proposal has support from nearly 60 percent of americans according to a morning consult poll biden took the opportunity to take a shot at the trump administration but the truth is, across the country, we have failed. We have failed to properly invest in infrastructure for half a century. The last four years, how many times you say this is going to be infrastructure week? Well, I got so tired of hearing infrastructure week, nothing, nothing happened. Nothing has happened. Biden says his plan would create jobs by putting people to work on things like repairing bridges, replacing lead water pipes, creating a resilient energy grid, and expanding broadband internet. All that would cost $2.2 trillion over 15 years. It would be paid for by increasing the corporate tax rate, partially rolling back Donald Trump's 27 tax cuts, and closing corporate tax loopholes. Biden says what he's proposing is badly needed and can be paid for while still growing the economy. 
trickle down ain't working very well, man. We got to build from the bottom and up and the middle out. That's how we build America. That's how we built it so well back in the 60s. He emphasizes that he's not a deficit spender. He refers to Trump's 2017 tax cut that created a $2 trillion deficit. I don't want to punish anybody. You're entitled to be a millionaire or a billionaire. Just pay your fair share. Just pay, for example, if we just were to make sure that we had the tax rate for the top rate in America for income tax, what it was in the Bush administration, it would go from 36 to 39.6 percent. Well, guess what? That, that, that would raise a minimum of $10 billion a year. No one's hurt. Someone making that money is still going to have two homes or a jet plane or these are mostly millionaires. They're not going to be hurt a little bit. Despite public opinion, Republican lawmakers have opposed Biden's infrastructure plan, saying it's too expensive and has too broad a definition of infrastructure. Last week, Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell said, I'm going to fight this every step of the way because I think this is the wrong prescription for America. Biden is now saying he could compromise on the corporate tax break, accepting a 25% tax rate instead of a 28% tax rate. He says he's willing to hear ideas from both sides. I'm meeting with my Republican friends up in the, uh, up in the Congress to see, number one, how much they're willing to go for, what they think are the priorities, and what compromises meet men. I'm ready to compromise. What I'm not ready to do, I'm not ready to do nothing. I'm not ready to have another period where America has another infrastructure month and doesn't change a damn thing. After the Lake Charles remarks, Biden went on to New Orleans, where he was scheduled to visit a sewage plant where half of the 100-year-old turbines are broken. Beyond that, he'll continue to carry his message about the American Jobs Plan. This is all about making a choice. A choice between giving tax breaks to super wealthy and to corporations and investing in working families. We're going to build a country. I look at this as what I'm talking about is giving essentially tax breaks to hard working middle class and working people who built this country. In my view, it's an easy choice. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The number of Americans filing first-time unemployment claims is at its lowest level since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. It's fresh evidence the U.S. economy may be rebounding. Nick Harper reports. The figures from the U.S. Labor Department show 498,000 Americans claimed unemployment benefits for the first time last week. With the vaccination rollout continuing and businesses reopening, more people are being pulled back into work, showing a labor market that's recovering. It's a stark contrast to this time last year, when more than 2.7 million Americans were new claimants and unemployment was above 15 percent nationwide. This Friday, we'll see the release of the monthly jobs report, with an expected one million jobs added during April. I'm Nick Harper in Washington. A new attempt to estimate the death toll of COVID-19 puts the number at 6.9 million deaths globally, or more than double official counts. Dr. Christopher Murray, director of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington School of Medicine, announced the estimates today. The estimates by researchers at the University of Washington also suggest the U.S. death count is more than 905 The official government count is about 575,000 American deaths. Health experts say official COVID death statistics are undercounts for a variety of reasons. Governments may miss deaths that don't occur in hospitals or where a confirming COVID test wasn't done on the patient. The University of Washington researchers believe the largest undercounts are in India, which may have close to three times more deaths than the 221,000 official government death count, and in the Russian Federation, which they calculate had more than five times the 109,000 official government count. The other countries in the top five are Brazil and Mexico. The University of Washington Estimates are based on a comparison of pre-pandemic death trends with all-cause deaths during COVID, but with adjustments to remove deaths that couldn't be directly attributed to the virus. 
Several world leaders today praised the U.S. call to remove patent protections on COVID-19 vaccines to help poor countries obtain shots. But the proposal faces a multitude of hurdles, including resistance from the pharmaceutical industry. Nor is it clear what effect such a step might have on the campaign to vanquish the outbreak. Activists and humanitarian institutions cheered after the U.S. reversed course and called for a waiver of intellectual property protections on the vaccine. The decision ultimately is up to the 164-member World Trade Organization. And if just one country votes against a waiver, the proposal will fail. The Biden administration announcement made the U.S. the first country in the developed world with big manu- vaccine manufacturing to publicly support the waiver idea floated originally by India and South Africa in October. French President Emmanuel Macron embraced it today as well. However, like many pharmaceutical companies, Macron insisted that a waiver would not solve the problem of access to vaccines. He said manufacturers in places like Africa are not now equipped to make COVID-19 vaccines, so donations of shots from wealthier countries should be given priority instead. India, as expected, welcomed the move. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison called the U.S. position great news. Russian President Vladimir Putin said his country would support it. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez welcomed the U.S. decision, too. But German Chancellor Angela Merkel's office spoke out against it. Simon Marks reports. The German government is rejecting calls for patent protections on COVID-19 vaccines to be temporarily waived after the Biden administration on Wednesday night backed the idea. Earlier on Thursday, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said she was willing to assess the proposal. But now Berlin says the protection of intellectual property is key to innovation. India was one of the first countries to promote the idea of waiving the patents temporarily. Giant Dasgupta is the former Indian envoy to the World Trade Organization. There would be immense pressure on uh, the European Union and uh, Britain and Japan and the other countries which are also home to some of the large pharma companies which are patent holders for vaccines. So I think they will also come around. He spoke there on India's CNBC affiliate. Berlin is now on a collision course with Paris, where French President Emmanuel Macron supports the waiver. Simon Marks reporting. Moderna today released the results of its COVID-19 vaccine trials for those aged 12 to 17, reporting it 96% effective against the virus. The vaccine manufacturer said its trial involving 3,200 participants recorded 12 COVID-19 cases that emerged beginning 14 days after the first dose of the vaccine. The company said it had not identified any serious safety concerns by the use of the vaccine to date. The results of the adolescent trial came as the Food and Drug Administration is expected to give emergency use authorization for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to be used among 12 to 15 year olds in the coming days. Pfizer and BioNTech found their vaccine to be 100% effective among the 12 to 15 age group in research released last month. Unlike Moderna's vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine already has FDA emergency approval to be given to 16 and 17 year olds. Both the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines can only be given to those who are at least 18. But the manufacturers have been taking steps to get emergency approval for children and teenagers. Sarah Walton reports. The biotech company says early figures show the Moderna shot was 96% effective in young people aged between 12 and 17. More than 3,200 participants took part in the trial with no major side effects recorded. Moderna also revealed its vaccine generated $1.7 billion in revenue in the first quarter of the year. Coronavirus vaccines are currently only approved for use in people over the age of 16 in the U.S., but Pfizer is expected to receive federal authorization for use in younger teens later this month. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. 
Two of the San Francisco Bay Area's largest mass vaccination sites will close later this month. Both the Oakland Coliseum and San Francisco's Moscone Center sites scheduled to close amid a push to focus more on local community pharmacies and stores. It's also an indication of how well the vaccine rollout has been going in the Bay Area at its peak, county health officials say. The Coliseum site was vaccinating about 4,000 people a day. That number now down to about 400. Officials say about 76% of Alameda County residents have gotten at least their first dose, as have about 72% of San Francisco residents. Vaccines will continue to be available at clinics and at pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS. India continues to post record coronavirus infection numbers. The number of new confirmed cases reached 400,000 for the second time. It also recorded more than 4,000 deaths within the last 24 hours. No other country has seen a bigger daily surge since the start of the pandemic. Neha Punya reports from New Delhi. In the first six days of this month, India has already added more than 2 million cases to its total tally as the outbreak shows no signs of slowing down. Meanwhile, the government has finally confirmed that the B1617 double mutant variant first found in India is linked to the current surge in cases. The government also says a third wave is inevitable and that it can't predict when it will hit India. More than two weeks in, oxygen shortages continue to plague India's capital New Delhi with citizens still force to fend for themselves. The Modi government has also turned down the Delhi government's request to bring in the army to set up field hospitals in the national capital. It says the armed forces are already stretched. Neha Punya, New Delhi. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. As much of California continues to drop COVID-19 restrictions feels like normalcy is just around the corner. But for members of the Indian diaspora with family back home, things are feeling anything but normal. India is pushing through the darkest days yet of the pandemic. And Indian Americans in the San Francisco Bay Area are doing everything they can to help. KPFA Sam Anderson files this report. Reshma Haider is an investment advisor from Los Altos, but most of her family lives in Uttar Pradesh, in the northern part of India. She says she lost 16 members of her extended family to COVID-19 just in the past two weeks. Every day, she scrolls through dozens of messages on WhatsApp, witnessing people back home frantically trying to secure medical care for their loved ones. Especially when someone messages, you know, I'm looking for a bed, I'm looking for oxygen, and by the time we're just sharing the information that we gather... The person replies back that, never mind, I just lost him, I just lost her. It's just tragic. I can't even explain the feeling. It's just, uh, it's just your heart heart sinks because it's one thing that, you know, somebody is admitted, they're intubated, they're going through this process where you know that they might make it, they might not make it, they're in the ICU. Here it's like somebody's breathing and you're hearing that they're taking them to the hospital and they're looking for oxygen and then they say, no, they just took their last breath. The official death toll in India is currently between three and 4,000 deaths per day, but experts say it's likely much higher. And the reports that Bay Area residents like Hyder are hearing from their relatives in India paint a harrowing picture. Hospital systems are on the brink of collapse. People are using Facebook and WhatsApp to source oxygen tanks on the private market. Securing medical care for a loved one often comes down to personal connections and sheer luck. We had been trying to use all of the contacts that we had You know, the most elite people in India are dying like this. You can just imagine what it must be like for 95% of the population. A Prajit Mahajan, a professor at UC Berkeley, says he visited India back in November 2020 when his father became infected during the country's first coronavirus wave. When his father's oxygen levels dropped, his family spent eight hours driving around Delhi searching for a hospital that could take him. They finally found a bed at one of the better hospitals in the city. He received oxygen, then he was intubated. Then, two weeks later, he passed away. Mahajan was alone in a hotel room quarantining when he heard the news. And I didn't get to see him at all. After his father died, Mahajan went to the hospital, and despite the risk, they let him into the COVID ward to view his father's body. It was out of some dystopic situation. There were like 10 
patients, you know, comatose on beds, and there was maybe one nurse there. Uh, and now you're probably looking at one nurse for every 30 or 40 patients. You know, right now, I think things are just like three to five times as bad as they were in November. Mahajan emphasized that his father, a government employee and a poet named Swatantra Alak, received some of the best possible care, and that the vast majority of Indians do not have access to the same resources. But Mahajan's story didn't end there. So many people had died at the hospital that it began to lose track of the bodies. So while we were waiting to load the body, the person in the morgue said, you know, we're loading the body in the van. Do you want to identify it? And so we, you know, we, we went toward the back of the van and, and, and it was actually the wrong body. It was someone else. Uh, you know, the, the sort of comic horror of it was, <laughs> it made it easier to deal with in some sense because it just was so... We just felt like you were in some kind of, uh, yeah, some black farce or something. As India's efforts to stem the spread are falling short, international aid has begun to flow into the country. President Joe Biden has pledged oxygen-related supplies, vaccine doses, and therapeutics. But now they are running into logistics problems getting the supplies to oxygen-starved patients. Gunita Singh Bala is a former physicist who created the 1947 Partition Archive in Berkeley, which documents the stories of people who witnessed the creation of India. Now the problem is that a lot of stuff that was sent by governments is like stuck in customs. So like people are dying in Delhi and a stone's throw away. All the stuff is sitting at the airport. The disaster is so huge that I, I'm just having hard time wrapping my mind around it. It's almost like Modi's just given up or something. While some believe Prime Minister Narendra Modi has given up, the Indian-American community in the Bay Area certainly has not. For her part, Singh Bala has directed all of the donors from the Partition Archive to support aid being sent to India. And she has transformed the organization's social media channels from oral history about India's independence into a source of public health information in the many different languages spoken throughout India. This is important, she says, because misinformation about topics like the vaccine is rampant, especially in rural villages. Given the critical uh, situation in India with regards to the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, we will be showing you some new programming. And in Silicon Valley, some Indian American entrepreneurs are leveraging their expertise in businesses and technology to address problems like the lack of oxygen. Raish Mahider, the investment advisor who lost 16 of her family members, is involved with a company called OxyKit, which is developing open source kits that the maker community in India can use to build their own oxygen concentrators. It's actually a fully uh, open source project. And the, the idea was that you could just go to your local hardware store, get your things and, and build it yourself. She also redirected the efforts of a company she runs in Pakistan from making robotic supplies into making face shields and other medical equipment they are distributing for free to Indian hospitals. But if there's one thing the world has learned about COVID-19 in the past year, it's that innovative technology and ample resources still don't stem the tide of pain and death that COVID leaves in its wake. Gunita Singhbala says while the U.S. may be turning a corner on the pandemic, it shouldn't be turning its back on the nations like India still struggling through it. It's like, guys, it's not over yet. These viruses, the more they spread, the more they mutate. Ultimately, there will be a mutation that's going to evade vaccines, right, if we keep this up. So even on a selfish note, it, I think Americans should care because this virus could come back to them. Reporting for KPFA, I'm Sam Anderson. An online petition calling for the Tokyo Olympics to be canceled has gained tens of thousands of signatures since being launched in Japan just days ago. The rollout comes with Tokyo, Osaka, and several other major areas under a state of emergency. With coronavirus infections on the rise, the state of emergency is to expire on May 11th, but reports in Japan say it's likely to be extended. The Olympics, scheduled to open on July 23rd. The petition is addressed to the president of the International Olympic Committee, who has tentative plans to visit Japan later this month. Lawmakers in Nebraska were scheduled today to debate the Meatpacking Employees' COVID-19 Protection Act. Eric Gladys has the story. 
The measure, sponsored by Omaha Senator Tony Vargas, would require companies to implement protections, including six feet social distancing, face masks, and paid sick leave. Rose Godinez with the ACLU of Nebraska says workers in meat and poultry plants across the state continue to report dangerous conditions, including lack of masks, pressure to work while sick, and crowded cafeterias and locker rooms. We're not out of the pandemic yet. And we need these protections for meatpacking plant workers because they are providing essential food production for the country. At least 7,300 COVID-19 cases have been traced to meatpacking plants across Nebraska since the onset of the global pandemic. Public health experts say protections continue to be appropriate even as vaccinations are rolled out. Critics of LB241 argue the law is unnecessary because companies are already taking precautions and have prior- prioritize the safety of their workers throughout the public health emergency. Godina says many workers report not being able to leave work to get vaccinated or risk losing their job if they do because of punitive sick leave policies. LB241 would require companies to allow workers time off to get vaccinated. Godinez believes the measure is necessary to protect not only meatpacking plant workers, but entire communities still at risk of contracting the airborne virus. It will be up to all of us to protect our our hardworking friends and meatpacking plant workers. LB 241 would remain in effect until June of 2022 or until the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention drops its recommended protections. Plants would be subject to inspections and could face fines of $5,000 per violation, up to $50,000 for repeated violations. This is Eric Galatis reporting for the Nebraska News Connection. Hotel and fast food workers in Oakland say their employers are acting in defiance of the city's labor laws enacted during the coronavirus pandemic. Workers say that despite their filing of complaints with the city, their concerns have gone unanswered. KPFA's Chris Lee reports. Oakland fast food and hospitality workers say the city passed laws which were designed to protect them during the pandemic, but the city is failing to enforce its own laws. After being laid off in April due to the coronavirus pandemic, Edith Diaz, who worked as a housekeeping supervisor at Holiday Inn and Suites, watched her colleagues return to work, but not her. The ones that were kept, my manager said, were the ones that were not causing problems going to the city. Diaz knew her rights and advocated for her colleagues throughout the pandemic. Later in June, when the emergency paid sick leave law passed, I told a colleague who worked there that she had sick days due to the pandemic because I and others had fought for this law. My employer found out and later called me telling me I should not be talking about what was and was not in that workplace because I did not work there anymore. And he did not rely on me in July. passed a right to recall ordinance intended to protect event and hospitality workers who were laid off during the coronavirus pandemic. The policy requires employers to offer eligible laid-off workers any positions that become available. Los Angeles adopted a similar law in May 2020. These laws were enacted in the wake of complaints from laid-off hospitality workers across the state who reported their employers had either refused to rehire them or would only agree to rehire them at a lower wage. In Diaz's case, she discovered that the hotel had replaced her with a new hire in clear defiance of Oakland's right to recall ordinance, so she filed a complaint with the city's Department of Workplace and Employment Standards. They told me that I will have to wait up to years because there is not enough personnel to see all the cases coming in. Workers are protected on paper, but the city currently needs to actually enforce this law. According to fast food workers, another city ordinance enacted to protect workers, their families, and the broader public appears to be ineffective due to poor enforcement. Carla Valenzuela works at the McDonald's on East 12th Street in Oakland. She said during the pandemic, her employer repeatedly violated the city's emergency paid sick leave ordinance. Last year, many workers at my store were exposed to COVID and had to quarantine. At that time, managers weren't paying all the workers like they were supposed to under Oakland's emergency paid sick leave law, which was passed in June of 2020. During the pandemic, Valenzuela and other McDonald's workers filed numerous health complaints and went on strike because their employers did not provide adequate safety equipment 
enforce social distancing, or allow those with coronavirus symptoms to take paid sick leave. While some workers did manage to be paid for their sick days, Valenzuela says many others did not. She says workers are afraid to ask for paid sick time because they could have their hours cut in retaliation. Advocates argue that employers cannot be trusted to comply with the law unless there are real consequences when they don't. Miranda Diaz is a research and policy associate at the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Oakland has passed the laws. It set up the Department of Workplace Employment and Standards. And now the city needs to fully fund and staff up the department to carry out the work of doing investigations, responding to complaints, and making and enforcing plans for employers to come into compliance. In Oakland, I'm Chris Lee, reporting for KPFA. You're listening to the Evening News on KBFA in Berkeley, KBFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kbfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast, and it's airing each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekends and is archived online, kbfa.org. I'm Mark Miracle. In the House of Representatives today, the Committee on Oversight and Reform held a hearing on the nation's black maternal health crisis. The hearing looked at racial bias in the administration of black maternal health care. Chair Carolyn Maloney, Congresswoman from New York, her committee colleagues and leaders of the Black Maternal Health Caucus requested that the Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office, the GAO, conduct three new studies on the state of what they say is a public health crisis. Alyssa Martinet reports. Black women disproportionately experience maternal health crises, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Black women are three times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than their white peers and are 27% more likely to have severe pregnancy complications. Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney called the hearing birthing while black. Our nation is facing a maternal health crisis. Across the globe, our maternal mortality rate ranks the absolute worst among similarly developed nations and 55th overall. Black Americans experience higher rates of life-threatening complications at every stage of childbirth, from pregnancy to postpartum. It doesn't have to be that way. The CDC estimates that 60% of these deaths are preventable. The reasons for these racial disparities are complex, but they include lack of access to quality health care and implicit bias in health care providers. The racial biases do not follow education status. Maternal mortality for black women with a college education or higher is still 1.6 times that of white women with less than a high school diploma. Charles Johnson's wife, Kira, died of hemorrhaging after a routine C-section at Cedar sinai a hospital in Los Angeles, California. Both Charles and his late wife are black, and he says that she was left to bleed internally for 10 hours before hospital staff took action. But there's no statistic that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18-month-old that his mommy's never coming home. For all the wonderful work that you're doing, you cannot legislate compassion. And it was lack of compassion and lack of humanity that failed my wife and is failing black mothers time and time again. It was not my wife's race that was a risk factor. She did everything right. It was racism that was the risk factor. And so we must do better. Johnson is now an advocate for improved maternal health policies and is the founder of 4Kira for Moms, an organization that works to educate the public and pass legislation around maternal mortality. 4Kira for Moms is currently calling on Congress to pass H.R. 1318. The bill will support states in their work to maintain the health of mothers before, during, and after childbirth. Black actress and advocate Tatiana Ali says that she also faced a traumatic experience during the birth of her first child. She spoke to how unequal treatment can be caused by long-held racial biases, including ideas like black women have thicker skin or black women don't feel as much pain. These biases lead to different treatment and outcomes. For example... 
black women receive less anesthesia for the same procedures as their white counterparts. I've heard firsthand stories of people in pain being dismissed, threatened, called drug seeking. I've heard stories of the sheriff's department coming to homes in the middle of the night because families refuse to take elective tests. We are being mishandled, ignored, sterilized, and completely disrespected. We need more black midwives, black doulas, culturally competent birth workers, and they need to be supported in their work. They need to be covered by all health plans so that adequate care ceases to be a luxury. We need to demedicalize birth. We need redress with hospitals that fail us so completely. We need racial bias and trauma training, postpartum and lactation support. We need to be heard and believed. Speakers from both sides of the aisle expressed their support for legislation to prevent future mortality among black birthing people. Members are also asking the GAO to complete three reports to collect data needed to inform good policy. The first would cover how the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated America's black maternal health crisis. The second would analyze the country's perinatal workforce. And the third would address how the country's maternal health crisis disproportionately affects pregnant people who are incarcerated. I'm Alyssa Mardinay for KPFA News. A hearing on Capitol Hill today on whether updating state voter registration lists can result in voter purges or voter suppression. Federal law requires that states remove people who are no longer eligible to vote because they have died or moved out of state from their voter registration rolls. That's called list maintenance, and it's a normal part of the election process. However, voting rights advocates have questioned use of the National Voter Registration Act to suppress the vote. And that was the issue at the congressional hearing today by the Committee on House Administration. Republican Congressman Brian Steele of Wisconsin advocates for more frequent updates of voter registration rolls. He accused Democrats, such as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, of misrepresenting routine list maintenance procedures as acts of voter suppression. He says that voters who move can and should re-register. There's nothing that should be controversial about ensuring people who have died or moved away aren't registered at their old address. The state's refusal to comply with NVRA is expensive, it's wasteful, it creates voter confusion, and it weakens weakens voter confidence in election results. There have been numerous instances where states remove voters from rolls based on inaccurate information or outdated citizenship information especially raising alarms for the Latino community. In 2019, the Texas Attorney General tweeted voter fraud alert after viewing outdated records of citizenship. Most of the Texas residents in the data he based his tweet on had at that point become naturalized citizens. Sophia Lynn Lakin is the deputy director of the American Civil Liberties Union. She agrees that voter list maintenance is a necessary part of the electoral process, but she cautions against disenfranchising voters when purges are conducted irresponsibly. Everyone agrees that voter list maintenance, when done responsibly, is appropriate and necessary. But proper list maintenance entails not only removing ineligible registrants, but also taking care that eligible voters are not erroneously purged. Unfortunately, states and country, counties around the country have engaged in overzealous, sloppy, and or poorly timed purge practices that have wrongly removed and ultimately disenfranchised eligible voters. Lincoln used Texas and Indiana as examples. In 2017, Indiana's system that was used to cross-check whether a voter had moved was found to be inaccurate 99% of the time. Voters were removed from the registration rolls based on that erroneous data without any notification that the removal had taken place. Dr. Mark Meredith is an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's published a study on Wisconsin voter enlistment protocols in 2017 and 18, and his study suggests that even when voters are notified of their removal from the voting rolls, the notification methods are still inadequate. Two findings of my study are particularly relevant. First, a majority of registrants who were eligible to vote at their address of registration failed to respond to the postcard. 
This highlights that giving notice is not sufficient to undo all of the damage when eligible registrations are canceled. Second, minority registrants were about twice as likely as white registrants to vote in 2018 at the address at which they were flagged as potentially moving from. This highlights the potential for new list maintenance protocols to particularly impede eligible minority registrants from voting when they're first enacted. The National Voter Registration Act of 1993, or NVRA, helps, but is not sufficient to prevent poorly conceived list maintenance protocols from unnecessarily disenfranchising voters. Sophia Lynn Larkin with the ACLU proposed automatic updates as a solution. She says automation would encourage voter participation and correct outdated information. Meanwhile, Florida today became the latest state to adopt voter suppression laws. Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed the bill into law today in a private signing broadcast exclusively on Fox News. He called the legislation election integrity. We're making sure we're enforcing voter ID. Look, you have to show uh, a picture ID to do all these other things in society, clearly voting. We're also banning ballot harvesting. We're not going to let political operatives go and get satchels of votes and dump them in some drop box. We're also prohibiting mass mailing of balloting. We've had absentee voting in Florida for a long time. You request a ballot, you get it, and then you can mail it in. But to just indiscriminately send them out is, uh, is not a recipe for success. The bill bars people from giving water or food to voters standing in long lines to vote. It also curtails mail-in voting and limits drop boxes. Critics say the changes will make it harder for voters, particularly the elderly and people of color, to cast their ballots. The League of Women Voters of Florida is joining several civil rights groups in challenging the new law. Patricia Brigham, president of the League, said the law is undemocratic, unconstitutional, un-American. The NAACP is filing a separate lawsuit to stop the law. The law comes after the November election in which a record 4.9 million Floridians voted by mail. Democrats outvoted Republicans by mail for the first time in years, marking a 680,000 ballot advantage. The new law apparently seeks to erase that. Voting rights advocates are organizing more than 100 actions this Saturday called the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Action Day. They're calling for passage of bills to expand voting rights, the For the People Act, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. They're also calling for passage of statehood for Washington, D.C., and action to address the filibuster. This week, a Wisconsin Senate committee heard testimony on a host of election-related measures. Critics describe that effort as a photo of voter suppression. Supporters say they want to restore faith in the system. Mike Mullen reports. The measures, authored by Republicans, surfaced amid sentiments at the national level of widespread voter fraud. Those claims were largely discredited by the courts, but many GOP-controlled legislatures still have proposed restrictions. Matt Rothschild of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign testified against the bills being considered in the Badger State. And this is corroding the very cornerstone of our democracy. You're playing with fire here. It's very dangerous. He referred to the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. A Republican senator responded by saying the effort is not about perpetuating the big lie about the 2020 election, but rather creating consistency in applying state election laws. Absentee voting is a focus of the proposed changes, including restrictions on drop boxes. Another bill would bar any individual from helping more than one non-family member return their absentee ballot. Tammy Jackson of the Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities argued the people her organization serves represent a significant portion of the state's non-driving population. Whenever we see bills that require somebody to get to someplace, that shoots up a flag for us that that's going to be really difficult for populations who can't use cars. Other Republicans backing these measures say the state needs to bring back confidence in the election system following the recent rhetoric from supporters of former President Donald Trump. And even if the legislature approves the changes, they are likely to be vetoed by Democratic Governor Tony Evers. Mike Moen, Wisconsin News Connection. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. 
A Florida man was convicted today of trying to organize an armed response to supporters of former President Donald Trump for an expected gathering at the state capitol in January ahead of Joe Biden's presidential inauguration. Daniel Allen Baker, 33 years old of Tallahassee, was convicted of two counts of transmitting a communication in interstate commerce containing a threat to kidnap or injure another person. According to the FBI, Baker used social media to recruit people in a plot to create a circle around protesters and trap them in the Florida Capitol. Documents describe what it said were a series of threats of violence made by Baker, along with a prediction of civil war. Baker was described as anti-Trump, anti-government, anti-white supremacist, and anti-police. There were nationwide alerts about potential protests at state capitals the weekend before President Biden was sworn in, prompted in large part by the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol by Trump supporters. In Florida, law enforcement agencies or agents were in position on the roof of the Senate and the House office buildings, the Supreme Court and the Tallahassee City Hall, which is a block from the state capitol. No significant protests, however, materialized. Baker Baker was kicked out of the Army in 2007 after going AWOL before being deployed to Iraq. According to authorities, an FBI affidavit said Baker was then homeless and largely unemployed for the following nine years, most of the time in Tallahassee. Baker is scheduled to be sentenced in August. He faces up to five years in prison, a quarter-million-dollar fine, and three years of supervised release on both counts. And Democrats are revising key sections of their sweeping legislation to overhaul U.S. elections, hoping to address concerns raised by state and local election officials, even as they face daunting odds of passing the bill through Congress. The changes would give states more time and flexibility to put new federal requirements in place after some election officials complained that the proposed timelines were burdensome. The bill would be the largest overhaul of U.S. elections in a generation and touches on almost every aspect of the electoral process. The tweaks are a small step forward for Democrats who have said that legislation is the top priority while they hold Congress and the presidency. President Biden said the bill, which would create automatic voter registration nationwide, promote early voting, require more disclosure from political donors, and restrict partisan gerrymandering of congressional districts, among other changes, would restore the soul of America by giving everyone equal access to the vote. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol to the far reaches of the globe to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. Federal officials announced today that the FBI's San Francisco office has launched a publicity campaign to encourage the victims of hate crimes to come forward. The Bureau placed an ad on a city train that reads, Speak Up, Be Heard, Report Now, Report Hate Crimes to the FBI. The ad also lists a website, tips.fbi.gov, where people can file reports of hate crimes. The FBI's efforts come amid a wave of attacks against Asian Americans, many of them elderly in San Francisco and across the country. This week, a man is accused of stabbing two elderly Asian women as they waited for a bus in downtown San Francisco. Patrick Thompson, 54, was arrested. He's expected to be arraigned tomorrow. The Bureau also launched a social media campaign that includes a photo of an elderly Asian woman and a message that reads, 
Did you know many hate crimes are not reported? The FBI wants to help, but we need to hear from you. It encourages people who have been victims of a hate crime or have witnessed one to call their local law enforcement agencies or reach out to the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. The FBI in San Francisco is strengthening its efforts to investigate federal hate crimes by training more special agents to investigate hate crime and civil rights violations. It's also increasing its collaboration with local and state law enforcement partners and tribal authorities throughout Northern California and offering assistance and training on federal hate crime statutes. At virtual events, vigils, and rallies at state capitals and on social media, family members, advocates, and government leaders commemorated a day of awareness for the crisis of violence against indigenous women and children yesterday. At a gathering hosted by U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Holland and other federal officials, started with a prayer asking for guidance and grace for the indigenous families who have lost relatives and those who have been victims of violence. Before and after a moment of silence, officials from various agencies vowed to continue working with tribes to address the problem. As part of the ceremony, a red memorial shawl with the names of missing and slain indigenous women was draped across a long table to remember the lives behind what Interior Secretary Holland called alarming and unacceptable statistics. More names were added to the shawl yesterday. Holland, the first Native American U.S. Cabinet Secretary and former Democrat U.S. Representative from New Mexico, recalled hearing families testify about searching for loved ones on their own and bringing a red ribbon skirt to a congressional hearing that represented missing and slain Native Americans. Holland displayed the shawl in her office to symbolize those who have disappeared and honor the movement that rang the alarm. She believes the nation has reached an inflection point, saying it's time to solve the crisis. Reporter Brian Bull has more from a ceremony in Springfield, Oregon, with some 50 people in attendance. In the dark, in the bitter wind... Listen to a dream. Members of Ililu Native Theater and the University of Oregon's Indigenous Women's Wellness Group read poetry under trees adorned with red dresses. Co-organizer Marta Clifford explained the symbolism. To show a garment that's empty because the women are missing in many indigenous cultures. The only color that the spirits can see is red. Hoping that they can see the red garments that we put out in their honor. Another organizer, Lori Tapahanzo, said red garments are also visually striking. It's about creating visibility for the erasure of an entire generation of women, young girls, and our brothers that have gone missing. An honor song closed the evening as people prayed for the roughly 5,700 missing and murdered indigenous women across North America. For National Native News, I'm Brian Bull. Reporter Antonia Gonzalez of National Native News on observances in Alaska. Advocates in Alaska took part in a virtual missing and murdered indigenous people event Wednesday. They shared updates from different regions of the state about some of the work being done to find people and bring justice for victims' families. Jody Potts from Fairbanks talked about how the community came together earlier this year to help increase awareness. You know, we all need to really work on this collectively beyond just, you know, the call to action for, you know, um, government, for policy change, for law enforcement, for training, for all of these pieces and elements to move this issue forward to help end this epidemic. You know, I really feel strongly about also looking internally within our own communities and like how our we applying our values and being accountable to our own indigenous values in this issue. The Fairbanks, Alaska Native community is leading efforts by holding rallies, organizing a search, and offering a reward fund. The Alaska event included speakers talking about healing, including a MMIW canoe. Advocate and elder Doug Modig talked about the canoe. Personal watercraft is part of our heritage. It is part of who we are as a people and how we survive. And they talk about 10,000 years of survival right here on this land. 
not only can we do this, it is uh, it is our responsibility to show the world that not only can we do this, but that um, we will. And together, we can do what we can't do alone. The event featured a healing jingle dress and a dance group shared an honor song. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. A flash mob of mostly young people in Myanmar's biggest city today staged a brief protest march against military rule. The latest in a series of actions aimed at reducing the chances of a deadly response by the authorities. In the five-minute protest in Yangon, about 70 marches chanted slogans in support of the civil disobedience movement that opposes February's army coup that ousted the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. They then scattered onto the or among the downtown crowds. Protests also took place in other cities and towns, including Mandalay, the country's second biggest city, where Buddhist monks marched, and Dawe in the southeast, where the demonstrators included engineers, teachers, university students, and members of LGBT groups. After the military government began using lethal force to suppress demonstrations, protesters in some towns and neighborhoods began organizing themselves into homegrown militias or defense groups. Now, the anti-military shadow government, formed by elected lawmakers who were barred from taking office by the military, the National Unity Government, or NUG, have announced a plan to unify these local groups into a National People's Defense Force, which would serve as a precursor to a federal union army of democratic forces, including ethnic minorities. Simon Marks reports. The People's Defence Force is being created by a shadow government formed by democracy activists who are being threatened with treason charges. The size and scale of the force has not been disclosed. Analyst Richard Rower with the German Institute for Global and Area Studies says while the threat to create a pro-democracy army might seem risky, in reality the situation in Myanmar can't get much worse. This uh, People's Defence Force, as it's called, um, is essentially the first step uh, towards a federal army uh, organized by the pro-democratic uh, forces in the country. Uh, of course, you're familiar with the scenes that have gone around the world uh, of uh, soldiers shooting down unarmed civilians in the streets. Uh, but it's important to point out that at the same time, uh, the flying airstrikes on uh, territories um, controlled by ethnic armed groups that are sheltering uh, thousands uh, of refugees, and so we're really already at a state of uh, total escalation. Human rights groups say more than 760 people have been killed by the Myanmar army since the coup on February the 1st. Members of the shadow government are in hiding. Simon Marks reporting. The Biden administration is proposing to evoke a rollback on bird protections enacted during the Trump administration. The ruling question weakened the government's power to enforce a century old law protecting most U.S. bird species. Today's announcement comes after the Trump administration halted prosecutions under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act for accidental but avoidable bird deaths. Interior Secretary Deb Holland said the move to end the Trump rule will help ensure agency decisions are guided by science. The prohibition against accidental bird deaths was most notable in a $100 million settlement by energy company BP after officials said the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill killed about 100,000 birds. Sunny and windy around the San Francisco Bay tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s. Inland, it will be sunny, not so windy, with highs in the mid-70s. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny skies with highs in the mid-80s. And partly cloudy skies are predicted for the Los Angeles area with highs in the low 70s. That is it for the news tonight. For this Thursday, May 6th, thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Merkel. Good evening.
Tune in Thursday nights starting at 7 p.m. for Apex Express, a weekly magazine style radio show featuring the voices and stories of Asians and Asian Americans from all corners of their communities. Then at 8, it's a unique mix of singer, songwriter, folk, rock, soul, country, and RB on The Bonnie Simmons Show. Finally, at 10 p.m., The Here and Now with Dirk Richardson, bringing you a mix of singer songwriters to avant garde jazz, old faves, new voices, and live performances. That's Thursday nights on 94.1 KPFA and KPFA.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.